I was a project leader of the first phase of the Reinvented Toilet Challenge, and then specifically in uh, making this new technology <coughs> ready for the uh, yeah, BOP market. Uh, I cooperated with another team within our university, which was more focused on the plasma gasification. Um, but I will um, explain to you uh, today how we sort of integrated both the really hardcore technology development with the human centered design. Um, I'll first talk a little bit about the setup of this um, project and where I come from, the Delft University of Technology. Um, I'm sure lots of you must have already heard about the Reinvented Toilet Challenge, but I'll briefly touch upon it. Uh, our approach, the uh, technology opportunities of plasma gasification, uh, when treating human waste, really. and the free framework we developed for actually integrating this technology development with the human-centered uh, innovation. We did uh, research uh, very near here in Durban and uh, in Delhi in South Africa to test our prototypes and to see how people would uh, respond to this kind of uh, innovation, uh, of which I'm going to show you the, quickly the results. So, um, as I've already told you, uh, we are a cooperation between uh, the Process and Energy Department of <coughs> the University and the Industrial Design Department. And we're sort of developing this technology in tandem, so the human centered design, so the, the, yeah, the toilet design, for instance, the business modeling, uh, how the implementation plan would look like, and the um, lab research of the scientists developing the plasma gasification technology. Uh, our vision on the reinvented toilet. Um, we would uh, actually like to make an off the grid system which produces enough energy uh, and also water eventually to keep itself running. So it has to be completely standalone. It's a pretty ambitious goal, but we try to take it on with this uh, technology. So as you can see here on this picture, in a household, uh, all uh, valuable elements from, from the waste could be sort of reused within that same household in a culturally applicable way. So as you can see here, heat is being used for, for cooking uh, or electricity is used for cooling, which are um, benefits for this household. Um, I would like to explain to you this picture. As you can see here, there's, uh, as I already said a bit, we're developing from two sides up. So there's the sort of top-down technology development, um, which would eventually, if you would only develop the technology, it would at some point land on the market, and people may or may not accept it. Um, it may be very successful, uh, because it's, yeah, by accident, it's very sort of culturally accepted. Uh, but there's a very large chance that if you develop it only top-down from, from your lab, uh, it won't be successful, as um, many of you must have heard this morning uh, with the, the Gulper, I think. If you only develop your technology inside your lab and you never go out of it, um, yeah, there's a very small chance it's actually successful in real life. So with this approach, we're trying to also develop bottom-up from um, yeah, user groups and uh, yeah, the, the end users actually of, of this technology to actually create these user demands during the technology development. And this is a very complicated thing, uh, as I can imagine you all know when you're uh, working in this, in this subject. So we go up, we go from both sides. Both the user demands are taken into account and the technology demands. And you have to find a way of prioritizing it. And in the end, you find that there's a, a, a sort of a moment where these uh, touch each other, and as you can see here in the frail line, um, where both user demands and technology demands actually match, and you can actually start introducing this technology onto the market. Um, there's a large insecurity for us because we don't know what the exact uh, end results of the technology development are. So as you can see here, there's several scenarios that you can develop for with this technology. Maybe it's super successful and it produces a lot of energy, for instance. Um, maybe it costs some energy, maybe you have to add uh, other organic waste to it for it to be effective. 
So we took into account several scenarios for the efficiency of this technology. Uh, to do this, um, there's a triangle again. Uh, we uh, had three um, different areas of research, actually. We researched the technology in our lab in Delft, in Holland. And uh, we researched the context in two uh, relevant settings, in Durban, South Africa, and in India. Um, which we chose based on, on the initial framework we made for researching this technology in the field. I'll uh, first explain you a little bit about our plasma gasification technology, because I, I don't see so many familiar faces, so I'll explain briefly what the technology actually brings us. Uh, this is a, a sketch of how the technology would look like. Um, we have a plasma gasification, where you have a a plasma torch uh, gasifying the dried uh, feces, uh, turning it into hydrogen and other gases, which are actually turned into electricity by um, solid oxide fuel cell. So it's a very high-tech uh, solution. Um, and as you saw this morning uh, at Dulai's presentation, we're in the long shot area of the, most of the reinvented toilet. Project. So it's, it's a very uh, high-tech application for this field, but when integrated properly, uh, it could be a very efficient way of actually getting the energy out of this species and producing uh, electric energy. Uh, as you can see here to the right, the pre dried species will go into the system. Uh, as I said, this is still a sketch, we're still in development. So, uh, it moves into the reactor, where it sort of swirls into the plasma frame, and the, the Small, small particles of feces get yeah, gasified and uh, the gas is being filtered in these uh, three different filters and goes into the uh, solid oxide fuel cell on the left. Uh, one step behind that is actually the <coughs> process. Uh, in the middle you can see uh, the plasma flame uh, of how it looks in a, yeah, in a, in a normal setup. It's, it's being actually it's being used now for um, large waste incinerators in, in Japan and in the US, uh, but it hasn't been applied yet on this on this field. So we're trying to scale it down as much as possible to make it applicable in this in sanitation field. Um, unfortunately, I can only uh, present to you the initial calculations. Um, I wasn't allowed to present more details since my colleagues will patent. Uh, their, this application probably. So um, you start up on the left side with a, a sewage sludge. We tried um, a, yeah, a sample of Dutch sewage sludge for this application, and we found that there's quite a lot of, um, or quite a high energy content, actually higher than we would have expected. Um, 1700 kilojoules for uh, 100 grams. <coughs> um, as I said, yeah, it sort of. Um, gets transported into the or into the area near the, the plasma flame and uh, the gas is coming out provides electrical energy and of course some, some thermal energy. Uh, this graph is uh, based on a 30, 36% system efficiency of the complete system. Um, but looking at other applications of this plasma gasification in combination with a, a fuel cell, that um, efficiency could actually quite easily go up if applied properly. Oh, there's also some, um, yeah, some ash from 100 grams will have 30 grams of uh, yeah, ashes actually, which are not really useful anymore for, for instance, bringing by the other waste because they're uh, if treated in such a high temperature that they, yeah, they're encapsulated. But it could be used for other purposes like, like a filler or other material. Uh, this is the prototype we made for our presentation in Seattle. This is sort of, uh, just to give you an idea of how, how this would look like in real life. The uh, scale is quite real, though it still has to be developed further. So it could be like about a cubic meter. It's like a small factory actually, sort of uh, scaled down into one cubic meter. Uh, the, the benefits of this action is that the system can process huge amounts of waste in a very short time. We were uh, dubbed uh, zap that shit by the Dutch media because it's based on the microwave principle actually. 
it deals with a lot of volume uh, at a yeah, very quick time interval. Um, yeah, it's actually transportable. So that's also another benefit. It's quite small, quite fast, and transportable. So uh, these are um, already values of the technology we can already see and we can start using in our um, designs. Because um, that's what I'm going to talk about now, how we actually apply this technology in um, both India and uh, South Africa. Um, I hope this is visible for all. Um, as I said before, we made, made a, a human centered design framework um, where we wanted to get a grip on a lot of factors um, and also things that we had to change before actually introducing this technology. So there's three steps in this framework. First, there's assessing the situation as it is right now, researching your context. Uh, then there's the if um, set section in the middle, which is um, if you want to change the set, the setting, actually the, the local setting right now in a, in an urban slum, for instance. What do you really have to change to generate successful scenarios? Um, that leads to the third part, where you have uh, several scenarios for applying this technology in real life. Uh, in different settings. So we uh, used this, this year of feasibility, feasibility year to uh, illustrate two of these scenarios. Of course, there are many more others. Also, if we wouldn't, would have wanted to apply it in Holland, um, which we're going to look into also, it would lead to a completely different scenario. Um, just to explain to you briefly, the context research we've been doing is like, first, now you start with, <coughs> with the people who are actually going to use it. So you have to get a grip on the culture, uh, the religion, which is very important. Um, for instance, in some religions, people used to wash themselves completely before going to the toilet. So they use a lot more water than in other religions. Um, yeah, the type of cleaning comes from that. The economical situation of people are in, so their daily budgets, uh, what are they used to, to pay for sanitation? Are they actually used to pay for some, some people's sanitation? And something which is often overlooked by a lot of people is that um, people have maybe one dollar to spend every day. And by introducing this new technology, you're going to have to scrape off some of the budget from some other purpose that people always used to, to spend their money on. So, yeah, you shouldn't be <laughs> too arrogant to say, like, okay, yeah, I'm just going to put the toilet there and people need sanitation, so they're just going to use it because it's there. So you have to actually make a proposition to these people and maybe <coughs> make it possible for them to spend some of their daily budget on sanitation instead of over defecating or whatever. Uh, the type of person is also very important. Yeah, who are you actually designing for? Is it women? Is it men? Is it children? Older people? Uh, and there's a sanita sanitary situation now. Since people are um, inclined to never want to take a step back. So, for instance, what we notice here in, in Durban is that people encounter a lot of flush toilets, uh, even if they don't have it themselves. Maybe the work they go to, they have a flush toilet, or uh, the shops you go to, they have flush toilets. So, people will never actually make the step to um, take an inferior toilet in their eyes for themselves. They will always want to get that flush toilet or a similar for their luxury um, for, their, their, for themselves. So you have to really take it into account um, what you're actually offering them. Then the next box is the, the stakes. This is more from a sort of like moralistic point of view uh, for a country or for a region. Uh, how high are the stakes for, for instance, phosphate or fertilizer? Um, how much water is actually needed? Is there a large need for water? Uh, energy and uh, health, and how yeah, how actually can you quantify this uh, need, for instance, from a government to invest in health, and do they really realize that they will get their money back at some point if they invest in this kind of sanitation? Uh, then the setting, uh, is it rural, urban, uh, the type of housing and the space people actually have for a sanitation solution, uh, if there's water available, uh, slum characteristics, climate and the government influence. Um, as you probably all know, government influence is also very important. We, we noticed in India um, that uh, governments actually try to discourage people from 
um, heading to the to the cities because there's such a high grade of urbanization that they tend to destroy uh, lots of urban slums every now and again. So actually installing a permanent uh, sanitation block there would be a large mistake, especially with the expensive technology like we have. So you have to uh, yeah, adjust your, your system to it and make it either uh, semi-permanent or movable or uh, try to bring people to the, to the system instead of the system to the people. In South Africa, here, for instance, the government gives a lot more to people and uh, even if slums are, have only been there for a couple of months, they get formalized quite quickly. So that's entirely the other side of the, the spectrum. So it's, the government actually gives much more to the people than, uh, than in other places. Uh, then the next section, then, um, service design. Um, the system has to be aspirational. <coughs> they will have, actually have to want to spend their money on this system, because otherwise it's not a sustainable system. They want to associate themselves with uh, this particular toilet system. Um, it has to be clean, of course. It looks very simple here, but it's yeah, a very important part. Uh, and affordable. And uh, affordable is also a very, uh, these are very heavy things that you have to live up to. Because, yeah, maybe it might be affordable for people, uh, but maybe they don't want to spend the money on it. And can you actually come up with uh, capital costs? And who's actually going to get the money for the entrepreneur to, uh, to supply this kind of system? Uh, the technology, of course, the input, the input has to be sufficient. Uh, it should be competitive with other uh, different options. So, for instance, for our technology, um, at the moment, it's not in any way competitive with, uh, for instance, uh, biogas in, in uh, more rural areas, since we need a lot of input, a lot of people to, to power it. Um, yeah, we shouldn't even try to compete with, with other kind of things on those other settings. So that's also very important to take into your system from, from the beginning on. Um, for us, this is very personal for our type of project. Most of the other factors can be used in other, other projects as well. Uh, we need to separate the waste as, as good as possible because we need to pre-dry the, the solid waste. Um, Where is the second point? Um, smell reduction is also something which is extremely important because uh, if we want to uh, actually um, conserve or keep the, the waste at the household for a longer period of time, we need to reduce the smell such that we can extend it for as long as possible. So uh, imagine if you would really reduce the smell like almost 100%, you could keep the waste uh, in the household for maybe two or three weeks before picking it up, which is much easier for your business models because it's going to be much cheaper and you have more time in the household to, for instance, pre ride waste before you actually have to pick it up, so it's lighter. So again, it's, it's better for your business model. Uh, volume reduction is the same uh, explanation, pretty much. And uh, the amount of local processing, so how much can you, for instance, in our case, pre dried it waste locally before you actually have to do something with this. It's very, very important. And the distribution. Uh, we already saw a couple of systems which are based on uh, picking up waste from households. Um, now, coming from our case studies, um, I think it, it may work, but it's still very um, hard for a lot of people to accept and uh, letting people in in their daily lives. And uh, yeah, it's still a taboo and a personal thing. So that the system really has to work properly. People will actually have to want to work in this distribution system. Um, coming from this, we have uh, two scenarios, which are still empty here. I'll show how we fill them in later in the presentation. Um, here I can uh, show you a couple of things that we learned from our case study in India. Um, so we, we did a lot of contact research, we, we did interviews with people, uh, we sort of tried to get beyond the, the answers that people give you right away, because it's such a touchy <coughs> topic. Uh, very few people will tell you the, yeah, the reasons behind it right away. 
that we notice, for instance, on the um, upper left picture, uh, that a lot of Indian mom moms have so many children that they never have time to actually take their children to a uh, shared sanitation facility and sort of teach them how to use the toilet. So these children are automatically forced to open defecate around the household, which sort of teaches them this kind of behavior that we yeah, prefer <laughs> we wouldn't teach them. So it's, it's impossible to start off on a, in a proper way. Uh, combined to that India is the country in the world with the most uh, children deaths of, uh, because of diarrhea. So this is really a, a focus uh, group actually of ours because yeah, the, the children are dying because of it. Older people will also have their, their problems with it, but mainly the children are, uh, are dying because of lack of sanitation. So you can see to the right here that there's a lot of open defecation areas. So we sort of research which areas are used for that and how you could maybe offer uh, assistance there to um, make people choose to use proper sanitation instead of open defecating. We looked at the ways people um, communicate sanitation um, and promote themselves. Uh, for instance, in India there's a, a large uh, toilet mafia. So this is very surprising for us and very good to know because if there's a mafia in it, there must be money in it as well. So uh, there's a lot of toilet facilities which are implemented by the government, but the moment the government doesn't control them anymore uh, quite carefully, the toilet mafias take over and start making their own business out of it. This is something yeah, you have to look at in Europe. <coughs> uh, in the middle you see a, a toilet facility right now, which is like an, an old train wagon. It's a semi-permanent semi place uh, because there's very, very little space in these uh, slums to actually make a toilet building. People also use these toilets for all kinds of other things, like washing, uh, getting water. So there's a lot of there's a need for a lot of water. Uh, in Durban, um, I've, I've taken a couple of pictures of our prototype testing. Before we also did the contact research, like I showed in, uh, in India. But then after our first visit to Durban, we started uh, making designs uh, and then testing these prototypes in uh, in Durban. Um, actually quite close from here with uh, Professor Chris Buckley. Um, first of all, the, the group um, of actually people that work with Chris Buckley, also our student group, started testing the prototype for real. Um, so they wanted to see, okay, how is this odor control? Is it, is it working out? Uh, yeah, what kind of problems do you encounter? Um, yeah, if you make a design, you better test it. Okay, so. uh, we also asked uh, people here, what they thought of it, uh, how they would use it, what, what yeah, other alterations to design to design could be possible. Uh, this design is actually it's um, a toilet where if you would sit on it, only when you sit on it, the, a flap opens and uh, the vault underneath is, is opened. So this uh, limits a lot the, the odor, so you don't get any uh, air streams going up, uh, and the sight also. The site of thesis is a very uh, repelling thing, and yeah, we might all know it, but it's really uh, actually seeing what somebody else did before you is really that yeah, counterproductive. For a lot of people, that would be a, a reason to say no to a sanitation system because you, you just don't want to see it. So this um, this sort of lid system tries to to battle that and also to prevent that people throw other things into the toilet. So it will be quite hard to actually sit on it and then throw other waste uh, down it as well. So. Uh, in India, we developed a toilet especially for children. So they learn from an early age um, how it is actually to go to a toilet and use a toilet. And we set up a whole system around the uh, sanitation facility, which actually helps people um, in their, their daily lives and also to sort of include the sanitation in, uh, in their, their normal day. So there's a, a payment system by, by telephones. Uh, there's a small sanitation shop where people get discounts if they get a contract with this facility. And uh, there's, there's a whole sort of elaborate social system around it which uh, helps people to actually take that step. And the benefits we get actually from this technology, so the energy we produce, the clean water eventually in the survived, 
get sort of fed back into the system so you can offer people services uh, which makes it more attractive for them to, to use this uh, facility. Um, one plan is also that we want to have mobile sanitation uh, buses or settings since actually if, yeah, we want to uh, get as much input as possible because we, for us it's become valuable so we want to actually locate these people in the, the peak hours when it's especially crowded at the, the, the fixed <coughs> sanitation facility. So by providing a mobile solution, you could actually yeah, catch them on the, the right moment. Um, this is also illustrated here in this, uh, this picture. There's yeah, sort of membership cards um, in, with a payment structure behind it. Um, if people don't want to pay all the time, like every time you go, you have to pay something. So it's better to have like a sort of payment system where you pay once in a month for your whole family and everybody can go sort of for free for the rest of the month um, and catching up people at the right time of the day. But I have to hurry up. Um, in South Africa we have a, as I, I told you before, we have a, a system which is uh, special for a household. So India was really a shared system. Um, here in, in Durban people are so used to having their own toilet that they will never really go back to shared facilities. So it's pointless to actually offer large shared facilities here for as a replacement of their household toilets. So we uh, developed a household toilet which already starts pre-drying the waste uh, passively in the home by having a, a sort of heated air tank on the roof of the toilet uh, where the air gets uh, forced over the, the vault to um, try and dry it as much as possible before we have to pick it up. So then we only pick up the dry waste instead of all the, the liters of uh, other uh, liquids. Uh, as I yeah, showed you also for India, there's, also, there's a whole system around it. So um, there is a community center where people can uh, sort of enjoy the other services that are attached. Um, since we realized people uh, spend a lot of their daily budgets on uh, transportation for their kids, um, um, we could sort of group these people so we could offer um, transport for them more cheaper. So you, you get the feeling of actually taking care of your family, taking care of the health of your family and the education of your kids associated with the sanitation system. Another thing is that people needed refrigerating. refrigerating. Uh, and, and cooling their, their food. So uh, we could offer this in a sort of shared, shared solution. Uh, instead of actually everybody having to invest in their own uh, fridge, uh, you can only pay for the, or use the service instead of actually buying all the products yourself. Uh, the, these two scenarios are now filled in uh, towards the right. So uh, Durban is really an ownership situation where people get their own toilet in their own households. And Delhi is more like a shared uh, solution where people get together in a shared facility. Uh, at the moment, the, the Delhi solution is uh, yeah, much more suited for our technology since we do not need a lot of people to keep on powering our plant continuously. Uh, but eventually, if our technology progresses, it might be able to use it in uh, individual households. Um, I'll skip this one for the moment since the time is limited. Um, yeah, as I try to indicate to you, I, I hope people will um, maybe take from this presentation that you always have to take into account uh, both the user demands and the technology demands while actually developing a new uh, solution in the sanitation facility. And um, yeah, if you would like to know more about it, please come and talk to me. My article, unfortunately, is not on the disk, but if you give me your business card or email, then I can email it to you directly. Um, yeah, I would like to thank you for, for being here. And are there any